tonight on Mississippi Insight. Scandal at the Department of Human Services. Six arrested in the largest case of embezzlement in state history. How this happened, what happens next, and were warning signs missed? Hello and welcome to Mississippi Insight. I'm Byron Brown. Thank you for joining us. The news was stunning when it came out last week. The former head of DHS, John Davis, arrested. Former DHS employee Latimer Smith, along with five others, including Nancy New, the owner and director of the Mississippi Community Education Center and New Learning, her son Zach. Anne Magoo, accountant for MCEC and pro wrestler Brett DiBiase. State Auditor Shad White announced the results of an eight-month investigation and a scheme to embezzle from the temporary assistance for needy families. Well, we see this over and over in our investigations. Money is intended to go to a place that the legislature and the governor by passing laws decided was appropriate and they decided that, that was going to help Mississippians. This is an example of money going to or should have gone to folks who needed it through a federal program, temporary assistance for needy families. To those families you say, I'm incredibly sorry that this money did not go to your benefit as it should have, but you need to know that you have advocates who are standing up for you and this is not going to be allowed anymore. It's stopping right now. Tonight we are hearing from lawmakers about what happens next. Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman. I'm, I'm going to say the checks and balances that I put in are going to be superior to what's previously been in existence. I expect you'll see us focusing on where we're going, uh, not so much on looking back. That's other people's jobs. Uh, our uh, public uh, health committee will be meeting on various and sundry matters. Uh, as, a, as a ground rule, uh, in the future, I do not anticipate providing any nonprofit entity that's not doing the services any money. Uh, we uh, for sure want to get to a point that if we're providing uh, money to any nonprofit entity outside the scope of the, of the state of Mississippi, that that entity is actually providing the services. You will see in our bills for the first time ever a requirement that they have quarterly financial statements, and if there's a 5% deviation from, their, from the amount that's been allocated to them, that they will footnote that. Those reports will be sent to the governor, me, and the speaker, as well as our committee chairman. Uh, we intend to have uh, a much better view of what's going on in our, on every three months as opposed to every three years. Uh, that's not, we're not doing that anymore. So you'll see us start a process of, of making sure that the, that the funds are ad, ad, adequately dispersed. A lot of those are TANF funds. Some of those involve workforce, and we are making, we're making several plans concerning workforce development now make sure we have control over that, that, that bucket of, of funds and making sure that it's actually achieving its goals. So going forward, I think you'll see a number of different things change. Actually. State Senator John Horn says there needs to be reform in light of what happened. I talked with him this week at the state capitol. Well, you know, we, we had seen uh, with the privatization of TANF funds for so-called training, uh, workforce development, uh, family dynamic training, um, uh, also after school programs uh, and, that, and it's not to say that there's not a lot of good work that's going on at DHS a lot of fantastic work but 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 when we saw groups that got organized specifically to go after private dollars uh, to, excuse me to go after the privatization of those dollars uh, that I think led to some, some opportunities for abuse and going forward uh, what I expect that we, we, we need to do, uh, whether we're going to do it or not, still remains to be seen. But what we need to do uh, is uh, to uh, uh, get as much transparency in the, in the program as possible. But tr transparency is, is good and bad. Uh, and, and, and what I mean by that, when you start putting in uh, rules and regulations that uh, inhibit the selection of folks who are doing good work, and I'll give you a, a great example, the Boys and Girls Club of Central Mississippi. They're doing fantastic work, and in the last round, uh, they didn't get funded under this new process of transparency, even though they, they uh, helped to provide after-school programs for, for nearly 7,000 young men and women, and they also have a 95% graduation rate and uh, a 95% rate of folks who go to college. That's good work, but they didn't get funded uh, under this new transparency. So, so we've got to be... Uh, intentional and, and I think uh, thoughtful about how we go about about ensuring transparency but also uh, making sure that we select good folks who are doing good work. And why would transparency stop them from getting funded? 
Well, uh, they, in, when the new uh, director who was, was acting came in last summer, uh, there was a sense that, that the, uh, the process was too subjective and too, um, uh, was without uh, enough par parameters for how selections were made and so forth. It, a lot of it was at the uh, behest of the, the executive director. Uh, they had a process, but it wasn't very tight. Well, they get in, get these evaluators in, and all they're, they're looking to see is, is that, that they check the box, that the applicant checked the box, and if the box were, was not checked, then they didn't get funded. But uh, there, there are a lot of groups that are doing great work. Right now, all of the money is, is, is frozen. So even sub-grantees that are, are, are innocent in this whole process are being punished because uh, they're not, that the funding that, that helps operate their programs has been frozen. And so I think we've got to find a happy medium is all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, do we expect to see more uh, people involved in the embezzlement scheme that happened with the DHS as, as the investigation moves on? I, I think we've just cracked the surface, to be f perfectly frank with you. I, I think that there's going to be more to come. And uh, give me a, uh, we haven't heard a timeline. How long do you think this was going on? Was it going on for a short period of time, or was this going on for years, do you believe? Years. It's gone on several years. and, and um, Again, uh, we here in the legislature started hearing about possible ab abuses as, as much as three years ago. So I, I would say at least three years, uh, but maybe more. We've talked about hearing four million dollars of that amount. Do you think it's more than four million? I think it's more than four million. How high do you think it can go? Tens of millions. That much money? Yeah, I do. Uh, see, what what we um, we saw uh, is. Twenty years ago, there were hundreds of thousands of TANF recipients in the state of Mississippi, for example. Uh, and then uh, ten years ago, it was t uh, uh, tens of thousands. Now, it's 3,500 families. But the money is still coming. The money, as if you had uh, 10,000 or, or, or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, roughly a lot of that money because it's based on the demographics of the state. And so, uh, what the, the, the department has done over the years is winnow down the number of people who participate in the program uh, but by putting up a lot of internal barriers that would qualify them or not qualify them, work requirements, uh, requirements of, of uh, actively seeking employment, uh, a number of, of things that, that are, are intended to break the cycle of poverty. They, however, really are not doing that because you still have a lot of poor people in Mississippi. They just don't participate in the program because of all of the rules and regulations that are imposed on them. Mm -hmm. A lot of red tape. For them to get a lot the of red tape. But yeah. the money's still coming into the program. The money's still coming into the program, and, and so Where's there the comes going? privatization. Mm -hmm. Privatization for workforce development, privatization <laughs> for after-school programs, privatization for family dynamics programs where you teach uh, people basically how to be parents and how to look after their children. And so it, it became a gravy train uh, for uh, folks who, who did not have probably the best interests of their clients at heart. They saw an opportunity to make money. So they took the money? Well, I won't say they all took the money, but a lot of them took the money. Mm -hmm. So is that you think it, through this investigation between the state and the, and the feds, all that's going to start coming out? Well, there's a, a request on the table for a forensic analysis, an audit of the Department of Human Services, which will do a deep dive into the agency. And uh, I, I suspect at that point you'll see a, a bunch more stuff pop up. Well, we've got to good, uh, get a, a good DHS director, first of all, consider putting in a new board uh, or a board that, that hasn't been in place for uh, at least 20 years. We've got to um, uh, make sure that we don't punish the recipients and the subcontractors who are innocent in this whole process, and, and also make sure we put some meaningful programs in to help break that cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think they'll get it cleaned up after all, all this is said and done? It's a big mess, and uh, I don't think we're going to see it cleaned up anytime soon. Uh, there's got to be more delving into uh, the, the, the recipients of funding and making sure that, that, um, that the money went where it was supposed to go, and if it didn't, 
bring more charges to those perpetrators. Mm. If those who are, who are been accused or found guilty, what should the punishment be, and what kind of message will this send people? Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave the judicial process to the ju judicial process. Uh, I, I think that uh, it, it ought to be appropriate to, to the crime. Uh, you're supposed to be helping poor people. You're supposed to be uh, lifting them up out of poverty, and what you're doing is you're making money off their backs. And uh, I think the, the uh, penalty should be swift, and I think it, it should be meaningful. Do you think it's sending a message, or it will send a message to others who are receiving these monies? Oh, no doubt. No doubt. I, I think there are a lot of people around Mississippi who might be shaking in their boots right now. State Senator John Horn says there needs to be reform in light of what happened. I talked with him this week at the state capitol. I talked with Mississippi Today's Anna Wolf. She had already been looking into how TANF was using taxpayer dollars. Anna, kind of talk about uh, where you are in your reporting on what's been going on with this scandal from day one. Sure. So I, I found that. Um you know, really uh, from the beginning, the way that this system was set up with uh, these two contractors um, who were um, engaged to operate a statewide program called Families First for Mississippi, um, were really uh, engaged to privatize, essentially privatize a portion of the welfare program. And the money that they were doling out to other nonprofits and entities that were supposed to be providing services to families, there was very little accountability and transparency in how that money was going out and being reported back to DHS. So in that way, it was kind of ripe for abuse from the start. Mm -hmm. uh, was there much surprise what you found from the reporting that, uh, that, that this came out, that there was an investigation, that there was an embezzlement going on? It definitely was a surprise that there was um, alleged theft, right? I mean, we knew that they were not spending the money properly. We knew that, um, you know, families weren't benefiting. Families who are supposed to be benefiting from this program um, were really not the ones that we were target targeting with the dollars. Um, but I could not have imagined that there was just this outright theft that's been alleged. Is this the tip of the iceberg or do you expect more to come out? Oh, I think we're going to learn a lot more um, as the investigation continues. Now you said you were looking through more documents. Uh, what do you hope to find as you read through those documents? Yeah, so I got some more records this morning um, that show what this entity, Families First for Mississippi, has done over the last year. Um, and so if you look at just the last six months, they, the two entities received about $10 million in the last six months as things have kind of slowed down. Um, and one of their main goals within the contract is to increase employability within the TANF population. Um, and so that's like, you know, uh, helping with soft skills like resume building and helping people with job applications. And in the last six months, they've reported uh, helping zero people with resumes and zero people with job applications. There's reason to believe that a lot of these numbers that they were reporting as outcomes were fudged to begin with. Um, but that just means that, you know, over the last two, two three years, where uh, $80 million has gone out, more than $80 million has gone out to these agencies, we don't really know what they've accomplished since then. I know there's been $4 million of what we've been talking about has been embezzled. Uh, does it look like there might be more than that? I think that um, we're going to find out more as the investigation continues, but I think what, what is really important that people understand is that we're talking about two nonprofits that received um, uh, in excess of $80 million over the last couple years. Um, and while, you know, we're talking about four, a, a little over four million that has potentially been embezzled, um, there's lots more that has gone out that there may be no criminal uh, allegations with, but that it wasn't used um, to benefit these families that it was supposed to be benefiting. So we're going to find a lot of information as this investigation goes on and what's happened to the money. Yeah, and I think it, it requires people being really critical of what we've been doing with this money um, because even beyond any kind of like indictments or criminal action that took place, um, there's still a lot of money that, you know, we don't know if it's done anything for these people. 
Have you been talking to some of the recipients of those who are supposed to get the money? Yeah, I have. Um, it's it's really it's really heartbreaking to hear someone talk about you know uh, just the scrutiny that's been placed on them when they're receiving these benefits. Food stamps, for example, SNAP. Um, you know, they have to do these redeterminations to, um, to get their benefits the next month. And so you talk about people who may have missed an interview with DHS um, who had their food stamps cut off for that reason um, and had to scrounge just to get food to feed their children. And meanwhile, as we're finding out, a lot of that money was misspent. What do you think is going to come out of all this when it's all said and done? <laughs> Well, DHS has already said that they are putting in more controls to better track that money. And so hopefully what, we're, what we'll see is um, a process to award these grant dollars to the agencies that will um, use them in the most effective way. Um, and I think we've already seen a change in culture at DHS. Anything new that you think you're going to come out in your reporting as you keep digging? There were a lot of agencies that were receiving money through this Families First grant. Um, a lot of them are legitimate nonprofits that have been delivering these kinds of services for years. Um, but I think we'll find that uh, through the money that's been that's flowed through, um, you're going to find a lot of waste. So it's just those. It's, it's it'll be smaller stories. It's not. I'm not talking about indictments or um, charges. But I think we'll see that that the money was not being spent on the families that it was supposed to be spent on. You're basically just tracking the money, where the money yeah. goes, whether it was embezzled or not embezzled, just where the money goes. Yeah, exactly. And what the outcomes are. Because mm -hmm. if we don't know what we're doing with the money, then we, you know, we can't say if we're using it in the best way for these families. Mm -hmm. Anna Wolf, Mississippi Today, thank you very much thank for you. your information. And we'll be right back. This past week, the Mississippi Legislative Black Caucus outlined its agenda to tackle some of the state's toughest issues. 12 News senior political correspondent Gerald Harris has the story. As a Legislative Black Caucus and mostly Democrats, their ideas are bold and likely to face resistance. Health care for them is a top tier issue, including addressing senior health care and infant mortality. Mississippi is one of 14 states that continues its refusal to expand Medicaid. They say they oppose any effort to do block grants with Medicaid expansion. Another important item is education and fully funding MAEP. Funding for public schools, the teacher shortage. A child should be able to receive a quality education regardless of his or her zip code. On the economic side, they want to see increased investment in the state's historically black colleges and university and go after predatory lenders. Mississippi is the only state that does not have a law that prohibits discriminatory lending practices by banks and financial institutions. In the wake of persistent problems at Parchman, the caucus wants bolder criminal justice reforms. Laws affecting nonviolent offenders, juveniles sentenced to life without parole, and habitual offender laws must be a part of the conversation. To try to get some uh, relief on our inmates, on our guards, and on, you know, the financial burden of the state of Mississippi. There will also be a push to allow early voting, online registration, and restore voting rights of felons. Reporting in Jackson, Gerald Harris, 12 News. Mississippi's new Secretary of State has a big idea to fix what wait times at the DMV, starting with moving it under his control. Well, Gerald Harris talked with Secretary Michael Watson about what this would mean. Six weeks into the job in Mississippi, Secretary of State Michael Watson wants to take on one of the state's biggest headaches, the DMV, and he has some big ideas. So look, what are the overarching ideas that we want to work on? One of those was management, uh, making sure that we have proper management. One of those was uh, the wait times in general. Again, people missing uh, time at work, uh, missing time at school and the productivity that we're losing out on, uh, but also uh, a lack of general customer service. 
Watson wants to take over the DMV services from the Department of Public Safety and implement his SIP plan, which stands for Service, Information, and Professionalism. The Secretary of State's office is a, a proper function, a proper area for this administrative and clerical function in the state of Mississippi. So that's one of the reasons we want to move it over. Now, Secretary Watson says he's not looking for any additional funding, just the already recommended amount to be pushed over into the Secretary of State's office. We believe that we don't need any additional monies from what they're already receiving. Watson wants to make several upgrades, an opt-in renewal notification system, a digital license option, an updated user-friendly website, and an increase in the number of locations and functions of kiosk. Reporting in Jackson, Gerald Harris, 12 News. And we'll be right back. Thanks to State Senator John Horn and Mississippi Today's Anna Wolf for joining us. Thank you for watching. We'll be back here next Saturday night. Until then, make it a good night.